everybody. So happy to be here. Um, as Tuan uh, stated, uh, I'm uh, the creative director of Wildbird Research Group. And um, we uh, study a lot of different types of birds, but tonight I'm going to be focusing on owls. Um, and most specifically, I'm going to be talking about northern solid owls and long-eared owls. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we'll jump into the presentation. Just before I get going, can everybody see that? Yep. Cool. And I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna move this a little bit so I can see what I'm doing here. There we go. Okay. Um, so we uh, we technically began in uh, 2011. We first started out doing uh, neotropical migratory research in Costa Rica. Um, back then, we used to be called Nicoya Peninsula Avian Research. Then in 2017, we had a couple different projects going, specifically um, a lot of stuff with owls. So we kind of needed to group it together and we formed the nonprofit Wild Bird Research Group. So now we actually have stations in New Jersey, North Carolina, Costa Rica, and actually we have a station in Pennsylvania. So I need to update this map. Um, so one of our, our biggest goals is we do a lot of population monitoring. We're trying to work on community dynamics, especially with native plants and how birds use the habitat, diet and food choice. And uh, we do a lot, like I said, with migration ecology um, because we have stations, you know, New Jersey, North Carolina and Costa Rica. So we literally kind of can follow the birds all the way down. And then we talk a little, we do a little bit of stuff with habitat selection. I keep hitting the forward arrow instead of just clicking, I apologize. So there are 19 species of owls in North America. We have eight in New Jersey and I double checked. I was like, I'm pretty sure they technically have 10 in New York and I was correct. Um, you guys have two more than us. Um, you have the great gray owl and the Northern hawk owl. Um, we get the snowy great horn barred barn, long eared, short eared, screech, and sawwit. Um, in New Jersey, five of these species are threatened um, or species of special concern for um, migratory, um, and that is the uh, long eared owl, barn owl, um, short eared, and the sawwit is actually still a species of special concern here. Clint. Okay, so um, sawwit owls used to be considered, um, people thought they were non-migratory, they thought they were really rare, they thought they um, were the most secretive owl, they thought they were most likely the owl with the smallest population of any owl in North America, and over the years we've kind of found out that to be the complete opposite. Um, most likely sawwit owls are probably the most abundant in many states. Um, they're just a little bit secretive at night, and sometimes it can be uh, quite hard to locate. Um, and probably in about the 80s, um, we actually kind of figured out that they could be attracted using audio lures in migration research. Um, so we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that. Um, so as I just pointed out, they are our most abundant owl in New Jersey during migration. Um, they are now relatively well studied in North America, and they're really a perfect model species to look at different types of ecology with owls. Um, so that's why they're the main focus for a lot of places. Um, and then, you know, why would wild bird want to go for studying owls? As many of you know, they're, they're kind of the apex predator. Um, they're also overall poorly understood. And they also seem to draw a lot of fascination with the general public. Um, everyone kind of seems to love owls. Um, I always think that it's, you know, that old adage of the wise old owl. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to click through these. I guess I kind of forgot that I didn't have these, the little things turned off. So, um, so we're trying to figure out the magnitude and timing of local migrations. Um, so every year we're adding to the uh, data pool on in our area when the owls arrive, when they're at their peak. And, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible to see every year um, when exactly, you know, we're going to get these owls 
we were always taking guesses. We tried to do, we tried to go real early this year and uh, it didn't work out. We had to wait almost two weeks of uh, long nights with no owls. Um, and then a lot of people are trying to figure out uh, continentally um, what the population dynamic is. And we're happy to add to that. And then we're also doing a lot of um, winter ecology um, about sawwood owls and long-eared owls. And next year, we're going to add short-eared owls in um, because there's a lot of conservation management out there for these three species. Um, and we've kind of started to find out that some of the data isn't all complete. So we're trying to piece the puzzles together best for um, you know, these large grassland places that are trying to manage for some of these owl species and maybe just don't understand exactly how these owls are using, um, you know, certain types of habitat. So we're trying to fill in those pictures. So here's just a general map of um, the uh, uh, northern solid owls um, kind of habits. Um, so uh, actually what I was talking to Tom earlier tonight is that um, I'm kind of excited because you guys actually probably have sawwood owls breeding in your neck of the woods. Um, this map is a little bit generous with New Jersey. New Jersey's year round is more like right here. And that's very rare. Um, you know, it's always still such a surprise when, you know, people get reports of sawwood owls breeding in um, the northern part of Jersey. Um, but you, you guys probably have them year round. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see, they're beautiful little cavity nesters. They do not create their own nest. They reuse um, cavity holes from woodpeckers. Um, you know, they might modify just a little bit. Um, this is a uh, natural one. Uh, and here, um, you know, in certain places, you can actually attract sawwood owls to nesting boxes, um, especially in Canada. They uh, have quite a few successful areas where you get these uh, little guys. Uh, this is actually, um, I think this might be the last like official confirmed report, <clears throat> excuse me, of Northern Sawwood Owls breeding in New Jersey uh, in a box. This was a screech owl box. And uh, this gentleman uh, was absolutely shocked to open the box one day and find these four little babes in there. So their breeding season goes from March to about April. Um, males, they're the ones that actually locate the nest and then the female does all the caring. Um, and that also ties into the migration. So I'll, I'll circle back a little bit on that. Um, they lay between three to seven eggs. The average is about four. And this is what you uh, eventually get here is uh, these little faces. Um, these, uh, these guys are, a lot of the data that comes from them is from nesting box guys, um, a little bit easier to see. Um, and then once they get a little bit older, you start to get these little eyes peering down at you. So the most common prey species for uh, northern solid owls are the white-footed mouse, deer mouse, and short-tailed shrew, at least in our area. I would think that the dynamic might be a little different up in your neck of the woods. Um, it probably would be something that should be looked at. So one of the main reasons for these uh, eruptive migrations um, of sawwood owls is kind of the boom and bust of the actual prey items. Um, so you can kind of see here that the abundance of white-footed mice um, is actually correlating with the um, success in breeding of sawwood owls. Um, so it's a cycle um, and a lot of it has to do with acorn mass. Um, so this chart is actually showing you the um, cycles of the acorns and the cycles of the mice. So when there's a lot of acorns in the ground, you're getting a lot of white-footed mice, and then you get a lot of northern solid owls. Um, so we get these large boom and bust years when we're um, trying to research. And you see this in a lot of owl species. Um, so here, for instance, you can see this female is literally just covered in white-footed mice. Um, she, she, the, the, um, Eggs hadn't even hatched yet in this photo, um, and the male has already been bringing her this much mice to cash. So this probably was a year that she, you know, probably had way more than four chicks and probably was able to, um, you know, feed them successfully. And um, I'm sure just like uh, myself in New Jersey, you also probably enjoyed quite the eruptive migration of other species of birds. Um, I know that I enjoyed the pine siskins quite a bit. Um, I had quite a few um, 
uh, purple finches in my yard. And I actually uh, finally had an evening grow speak finally visit my yard. So um, I was pretty excited. Um, and the eruptive migrations also completely correlate with uh, other owl species. So for instance, a lot of voles will eruptively, um, you know, breed, and then you get large years of short-eared owls. Um, same goes with the, hmm? there we go, snowy owl. And that's probably the most famous one that everyone's kind of familiar is like the lemming populations, boom, snowy owls, boom. Um, here's a typical nest. Um, this is in a, maybe a non-boom year. And this is a boom year nest. This is a, you can see a singular snowy chick has hatched and the nest is already covered in lemming carcasses, just waiting to be devoured. Um, so it's pretty impressive um, when everything correlates um, and you get something like this when it really booms. Um, this is the uh, snowy owl uh, eruption year of 2015. And I think I remember uh, the, uh, you guys had quite a few in some areas, like I remember the photo of one on like a telephone pole and stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty incredible how everything's really tied together in the owl world. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about sawwood owl banding now. So this is kind of the, um, the regular extent of the, you know, the breeding range. And this is the, when there's a poor breeding season, this is kind of the extent of the migration. In productive years, you know, you can get owls all the way into Florida. Um, and this year, we kind of saw a little bit of a mix. Um, we are a part of Project Owlnet. Um, Project Owlnet is a collective of different Sawit um, migrational banding stations. Um, all the red ones are active, all the yellows are inactive, but you can see that it pretty much covers the entire um, greater North America. Um, and this is our current um, foreign recaptures. So all of these stations that were all part of Project Down that have got, excuse me, have got our owls. Um, you can see that we get a lot um, of exchange between Ontario. Um, we uh, got one all the way up in uh, up in uh, Hillerton Marsh in Ontario, and um, yes, yeah, I, I guess none, none too close to you guys. Um, and we also have it exchanged um, a few owls with other stations, but a lot of stations have caught our owls for some reason, um, which is pretty cool. Um, a fun fact is that, um, you know, any of you are all familiar with bird banding, um, there isn't a high amount of recapture in songbirds, but there is a pretty high amount of recapture in Northern Sawwood Owls. It is the most commonly recaptured species of bird in all of North America. So how do we go about capturing sawwets? So we set up um, mist nets. If anyone has seen them before, um, they're long um, nets with multiple pockets that are pretty invisible. Um, the sawwet owl nets are a little bit uh, larger gauge size. Um, so that the sawwets um, get captured pretty safely. Um, we start out right before um, sunset, set up our nets, and then we set up these audio lures at our nets. Um, for the longest amount of time, no one was actually using audio lures. They were just blindly trying to capture owls at night. Um, and then, uh, in that previous slide, it was shown in like the, like the early nineties, Kate May kind of figured out that if they did the male saw what out advertising call that they could really up their capture rate. And you might think like, well, you know, does that play into anything about like, you know, are you only catching females then? Are you only catching males then? And the Kate May have been doing sawwood owl netting for over 50 years before they started using the calls. And the amount of females and the amount of males never changed um, previous to using it and then post using it. Um, so we're, we think that we're getting a very accurate picture while even using the the advertising call because females are kind of interested in it. And then the males are also kind of interested in it. And you know, it's a non-breeding season, so it's more of a curiosity thing than anything. Mm -hmm. um, usually whenever I give talks about bird banding, I just kind of give a quick little, you know, bird banding is a highly regulated activity. There's federal and state permits for everything. The methodology has been approved by, you know, the United States government. Um, all bands are 
um, given out by the USGS and you have to report everything that you do every year. So um, we just kind of just do that as a safe day. One of those, you know, don't try this at home type things. Um, so every Northern Solid Owl that comes in gets a new band, gets a band number. We record the date and time. We record the wing length and the tail length. And the wing length is really important um, because we use a differential um, calculation with the mass to actually figure out um, if the birds are male or female. Um, and then we um, can actually accurately tell what they are. So the other thing to note is that we get a lot more females than we do males. Um, females will migrate much further than the males. Males tend to migrate too much farther than, um, you know, where their breeding area is because they want to get back to the breeding area first. Um, like I said earlier, they're the ones that come find the nest. They're the ones that have to kind of attract the female. So we um, usually get mostly females, you know, up to 90% uh, of females every year. Um, so we started in 2014. Um, you can see that, um, you know, we had a little bit of, you know, eruptive, um, you know, the 100 and probably 2016, you know, could theoretically be eruptive. But in 2018, we had an eruptive year. We had 329 owls come through. One night alone, we had like 80 owls. And then sadly, 2019, it went down to 16. This year, we had um, 75 owls, um, but we also had three stations and more nights. Um, so that it probably is kind of more similar to the 2015 numbers. Um, we were thinking it was going to be a better year than it turned out to be. Um, I think 2021 might be a little similar. Um, and 2022 is the big one, apparently. Everyone's anticipating that 2022 is going to be a huge year for Northern Solid Isles. So you can open the bets with Vegas on that one if you'd like. Um, so the final step usually when we're doing the house is we're looking at the molt of the birds and we're looking at how we can age the owls. So solid owls and owls in general kind of have this really cool trick. Um, and I don't know if I can call it a trick. They have what we call porphyrins. Um, and it's a material in their, the pigmentation uh, of their feathers. And under UV light, it fluoresces differently depending on the age and the exposure to sunlight. Um, this wasn't discovered until the 80s um, by happenstance. Um, some gentleman that was doing barn owl research um, had UV lights in his barn or something. It's, it's kind of a kooky story, but um, everyone kind of figured it out at some point, and then they all published on it, and it has made life very easy. So <laughs> um, northern solid owls, like almost all birds, they uh, bring in their um, primaries and secondaries all in the same time when they're only a half, when they're in their first year of life. So no other time will you get uniform um, looking colors. So this is all pink due to the fact that these feathers all came at the same time. They all saw the same amount of sunlight. So almost all of our owls, um, especially in those large years are mostly hatch year. Um, like for instance, this year we, um, of the 70 owls, um, 60 of them were hatch year. Um, Unfortunately, solid owls, like many owls, they probably have about 85 to 90% mortality rate in their first year. Most birds don't make it up. You know, most owl species don't really make it past the first year. This right here is the typical second year pattern, second year pattern for the owls. Um, they retain this inner block of secondaries and primaries, and then they molt in new feathers here. And then you get something like this with the after second year pattern. Um, where you're starting to get multiple generations coming in. And a lot of this has to do with breeding. So birds can only do one of three things. They can either migrate, they can either molt, or they can either breed. Um, so they have to gain enough fat to be able to do one of these things. So they gain enough fat, they start to molt, and then it's time for breeding. They have to stop what they're doing, and then they have to you know, continue on later. So you start to get these very interesting looking patterns as they get older. Um, you also get these porphyrins in their pants. Um, we call them hot pink pants or hot pants. So solid owls, when they're on their, you know, when they're roosting or something, they, their, their feet are in, the talons are in, everything's in. So their, their legs don't get exposed to the sun whatsoever. So the porphyrins stay the whole time. So you get these hot pink pants. 
um, it's uh, it's usually a fan favorite when we do these little uh, banding demos when we're doing the saw with us. And the, the whole porphyrin thing, it holds true um, with uh, the long-eared owls as well. Um, after we do this whole thing, I'll just go back um, to a, we started writing a paper out for the long-eared owls because we actually found out that it is a little bit different. Um, some of the patterns we thought were holding true or not, um, but I'll, we'll break for that. So I told you earlier that we use um, this type of, um, we measure the bird's wing and then we get the weight. And this gives us this differential calculation of being able to actually tell if the birds are female or male or unknown. Sometimes, um, I don't know, um, it's probably, we, we, age, we are able to sex the birds 90% of the time. Um, for some reason, we get a lot of uh, very hefty females. Um, we had a lot of uh, very large females this year. Um, so it's usually pretty easy to tell. We had, we had a female this year that broke the record for us and it was 115 grams. Um, you know, in the, the, the smaller male um, size, that's about the, as much as a stick of butter. So a saw owl weighs about as much as a stick of butter in your house. If you were to you know, hold a stick of butter, that's what it feels like to hold a saw owl. Um, and like I said, the uh, females, they're the ones that are usually migrating in our area. Um, you know, we're, we're a bit further um, from breeding spots. So um, we get a lot of females coming through. Um, and like I said, the males don't travel as much because they're trying to get back to get to the territories. Um, so before we start, like hop into the habitat stuff and um, talking a little bit about winter ecology. Um, I just wanted to take a quick break because I know that these talks can get going and then people kind of forget the, the questions from earlier. Um, so if anybody has any questions right now, I'm happy to uh, answer some of them and I will uh, make this, make my little, there we go. Okay. Um, so if anybody has any questions now, feel free and I'd be happy, we'll be happy to, you know, Take care of that now. Also, if you have any questions during a talk, feel free to put them in the chat at the bottom of your screen, and then we can always come back to those later. Okay, then I will. I'll just keep on rolling. Um, so, um, two years ago, we started doing long-eared owl wintering ecology. Um, we've been doing solid owl winter ecology for about five years, and that consists of putting little radio telemetry backpacks on um, each of these species so that we can actually track them during the daytime. Um, here you can see these little teeny backpacks, and then, you know, we have interns and uh, myself and Tyler um, running around in the woods um, trying to find these owls, and uh, uh, we, we see a lot of little insights into their worlds. Um, here's, here's one quarter little saw wet that was uh, getting snowed on pretty heavy this year. <laughs> so one of the things um, that we kind of learned pretty quickly is that they um, don't necessarily um, favor evergreens as much as we thought, especially in the early part of the year. They seem to also really like deciduous trees. Um, and then the biggest one that I think a lot of people assume is that they roost, um, you know, at a low height. Um, and I think that, you know, it's kind of like a birder's um, uh, viewing of how, where sawwits are, because, you know, you kind of, you go to these, you know, evergreen and you kind of look for the whitewash and, you know, you're expecting a sawwit kind of low. And I think that's just, you know, kind of how people started to think they were. And we started to find out that they sure do like it up high. Um, if you, you can see from this photo, we, uh, um, we're down below here and that's where the saw what, uh, saw what ended up being. Um, so we're actually finding a majority of the roosts are um, you know, almost 81 feet up in the air. Um, so it's, it's pretty impressive where these guys are hiding. Um, and the long ears are starting to tell us some really interesting things, um, especially in the world of, uh, unfortunately, they, they seem to like invasive trees as their roosts. Um, they sure do like autumn olive. Um, and it's, uh, it has to do with, I think, the, the thickness of the structure. Um, so one of the other things that we're doing a lot of right now is we're doing long ear diet analysis. Um, so we are currently 
uh, looking after 17 roosts of long-eared owls in New Jersey right now. Um, and we collected pellets from every single one of those roosts and took um, data at every single one of those roosts um, to really try to start to learn more about why they're choosing certain roosts, why they're choosing it due to habitat, and learning about what their diet consists of here. Um, so soon enough, we will be uh, sifting through almost 2,000 pellets. Um, so long days. Um, we actually might be uh, getting some long ear uh, pellet studies out to folks if uh, you'd like to uh, receive your own long-eared owl pellets to uh, dissect at home. Uh, we uh, started doing that last year uh, at the beginning of quarantine actually, and uh, we're thinking about doing it again this year. Um, so make sure to sign up for the Wild Bird newsletter if you'd like. So last year, yeah, last year, we decided that we wanted to start learning more about the long-eared owl's usage of the habitat in their winter so we decided to contact this company and we designed these GPS telemetry bags, backpacks that um, actually give us data points at a 30-minute uh, interval every single day. Um, and I'm just going to switch over real quick to this because I want to be able to show you this in real time. There we go. So you can see, so we, uh, we use a special program to um, bring this to you live. So you can actually see this is what the real time, what the owl is doing um, over a uh, three month period. So this, this compound here, um, they have, uh, there's probably about 40 long-eared owls all in different roosts within this area. So this, this owl, this original roost here um, shows where we kind of caught it. And then this, these data points is actually showing you where the long-eared long owl is visiting, where it's maybe hunting, different types of habitat. Um, we actually uh, used a different program this year um, for six owls to collect this same type of data to be able to really show where exactly these long-eared owls are, um, you know, they're hunting, where they're roosting, where they're resting. And this, this kind of comprehensive study um, is the first of its kind. Um, no one's really attempted to try to quanti like quantitatively look at this type of data. Um, so it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, let me get back into this. So um, this is from this year, actually. This is another one of our birds. Um, and you can see that it really uh, had a concentrated hunting area. Um, you know, it would strive, um, you know, a little bit away from some, certain areas, but the uh, epicenter, this is actually where we originally caught it right here. And then the roost was somewhere in the middle of this mishmash. Um, but you can really see that these owls, uh, they do get around a little bit. Like, you know, these are, these are neighborhoods and stuff. And these data points are extremely accurate. Um, so it is pretty amazing to see what these owls are doing at night. Um, and then the latest study that we're working on is we are actually, um, we caught five owls for um, this new part where we're actually trying to track where they are going with migration. Um, so there are five owls right now with um, a different type of telemetry backpack that um, links up with satellites. Um, the Data is not being transmitted to us in real time. There's about a one day delay, but it's still pretty impressive. You know, we can we can kind of see where these owls are um, daily. Um, and this will also be the first of its kind when we're trying to see exactly where these long-eared owls are going. And we, we've done it so that the timing of the data um, is very intense during, um, it goes from about March to about May. And then it only take about a point every three days until September. And then it'll kick up again where it's collecting points every hour um, until probably February. We're hoping these tags last a whole year. Um, it's a little bit of a trick to see like how much energy you can get out of a singular battery on a tag. Um, but we're keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, this is the first time we've tried this, uh, attempted this. So, um, but oh, here, here you can see the 
what the backpack looks like. This is what the backpacks look like when they're on the long ears. Um, so it's a pretty big antenna that uh, can transmit us data. Uh, okay, so here is um, one of our owls. This was um, um, caught in like central Jersey. It moved up a little bit, made another jump, and then took a big jump up to, um, this is the uh, Delaware Water Gap region for us. And this is, uh, is a great habitat zone. Um, that's like the only area that long-eared owls have ever been recorded nesting in New Jersey. And then it kind of made here, made its way across, and is now in New York. Um, it actually has moved up further, um, but I didn't want to put it on because the, the data points get classed um, depending on their um, reliability. Um, they, have a, they have a tiered system for like how good your data point is because depending on um, how many satellites the, uh, the GPS can fix to um, depends on how quality um, your actual like data point is. It's not as um, of a fixed point as the habitat ones we were using before. Um, so it, we had a major jump um, where it was like outside of Oneata, but it was kind of classed in a, in a not great tier. So um, still waiting to get the data point tomorrow to come in. Um, and the other four owls, they haven't moved yet. Um, it's been a little funky here with uh, the weather. So um, hoping all those owls move pretty soon. Um, so we can really uh, find out how how these my how these owls migrate and why and when. Um, so that's about everything. Um, I uh, yeah. If you have any questions about sawwood owls or long-eared owls or um, migration or things we've learned, uh, I'm happy to uh, to chat about them. I've got a, a question. Of course. Kind of a general one. Um, mm -hmm. Am I coming across here? Yep, yep, perfect. Yeah, it's Terry Mosier. Um, long years, do they roost communally? Do they roost uh, in groups? Yeah, they sure do. Um, okay, you know, they... what's the story on that, of the size of the, of the roosts and so on? Uh, so, for instance, like, you know, the roost can be as small as one owl, two owl, three owl. Um, this year we had two roosts, one had 15 owls, one had 16 owls. Um, and in Europe, they, they, the roosts get even larger. Um, there, there have been reports of roosts of 30 to 40 owls. Um, they, uh, they seem to roost a little bit more in the, the Europe, you know, like in, you know, the European band, but, um, we can, you can have a roost up to 20 owls in the States. Wow. What about the roosting habitat? What could is that where they prefer the non-native trees? Yeah, so we're, we're not exactly sure why this is happening right now. Um, they, they, you know, they definitely do prefer cedars. Um, that's usually where we find the majority of the roosts, but we're finding in some areas where they get a lot of disturbances, they seem to be using these like autumn olive, like thickets, you know, it can get really thick um, uh -huh. and really secure. And I, I think some of it has to do with like, the amount of disturbance they get when they're like on trail sides and stuff. And, you know, it probably also has to do with the age of the owls. Um, it seems like the younger owls will, uh, you know, they get flushed quicker. They kind of um, leave roosts quite quickly. Um, the older owls, they seem to kind of know that if they find a spot and it's good, they're going to stick to it. Um, so usually we've been finding that they're young owls that are actually going towards these, uh, like, you know, autumn olive invasive roosts. So um, we're still trying to get more data on that, but um, it definitely, you know, it's an interesting thing. And I, some of it just seems to be, it's just like structural cover. You know, if we had kept native trees that were, you know, able to provide them a similar, you know, habitat structure, I don't think sure. they'll be going towards the invasives. Yeah. Sure. What about the softwets and contrast or, <laughs> or is it a contrast? They don't, do they roost singly? They do. They do. They roost by themselves. They don't roost in yeah. communities. Yeah. 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 John, is there any, so the, these communal roosts, are those just random strangers finding the same autumn olive or other family groups? Is there any kind of correlation between the individuals in these roosts? So, yeah. So we're trying to find out if they are, if it's family, if it's like a generational thing, or if it's just um, the, uh, you know, just the habit stance. Um, that's so 
we spent a lot of time targeting different roosts to get different owls so that we could actually learn this. Um, so we currently are trying to, um, going to try to take blood samples next year and uh, actually kind of find out that question because we are really curious if this is something that's like learned, taught, if it's, you know, genetic, um, you know, what's yeah. the, what's the deal. So um, we have, we did take feather pulls of all of our owls this year. Um, so hopefully we're going to be able to run it, but we'd rather just take blood next year and, uh, you know, make it easier on ourselves. Get the genetics. Yeah. yeah. I was intrigued by the map that you shared briefly with the, uh, the, um, long-eared owls and its distribution range and how clustered some of these areas were. So I, I can mm -hmm. see how their areas are really good habitat, but I was just intrigued by the type of habitat. It looked very classic New Englandy sort of pocket subdivisions, a lot of open areas, industrial areas as well. So I never see long-eared owls and I kind of expect them to be in pretty nice habitat, but that didn't look like much at all there. So is there, is there, I wouldn't expect such densities of long-eared owls in such disturbed habitat. Is there any reason why that many would be in an area like that? Is there food supply or is there, is there any other reason? So around here, um, that's just kind of as good as it gets. Um, mm. I think that um, you probably would see much more undisturbed habitat if we were to try to correlate the study to, you know, up in New York where you guys are, because, you know, you would just have much open, wider space, you know, the, that like pocket of habitat that you saw, that's like, you know, that's our biggest grassland in all of like the central Jersey band. Um, so unfortunately that's just kind of as good as it gets for the long years around here. Um, and like you said, one of them is like using like the back end of an industrial park as like, you know, one of its, main feeding spots. And some of that could be competition. Um, this year in particular, um, we're curious to see because we had such a large amount of harriers and short-eared owls, um, you know, that there was quite a bit of competition between all three of them, we think. Um, so in some of those years when everybody kind of like booms all together, there's probably a lot of competition for, you know, who's using what area. Um, you know, obviously they're a little bit more of like a dusk hunter but, um, you know, the long eards they, they were out eating, feeding quick, you know, um, that one, if you saw the, the main cluster of that one map is a small grassland. Um, and, uh, I didn't get into it too much cause we didn't have as much success with it this year, but we, uh, we got a thermal monocular. Um, so what we would do is we would do, get to the roost of our bird with radio telemetry, right as, you know, it turned to dusk. And then we would watch the owl with the thermal monocular, and then we would run after them and watch them hunt from afar. Um, you know, we test this out and it actually was really successful. Um, so we were actually able to compare what we were seeing with the thermal monocular with the data sets um, that you got to see where the live movements were going. So we're trying to do a lot of compare and contrast to, you know, kind of get the whole picture here. Um, still, still all kind of piecing it together so far, but um, like you noted, you know, not using the best of habitat right now. Yeah, one was in uh, a grocery store parking lot right behind it for, you know, a good three days and then, you know, decided to go back to its roost. Um, the other one is just like they have a main roost, but we're finding that they have a lot of smaller like roosts that they might use for a couple of days, then oh. change over. Um, but then they'll eventually come back to it. Um, but they always will go to their main roost, you know, after a couple of days um, where they're in the large groups. But sometimes in these smaller roosts, they'll, they'll like roost with only one or two individuals. And uh, then they'll go back to the larger groups with, you know, you know, 14 individuals or something. How much of what with other birds you call uh, winter sight fidelity is there with these owls? Uh, how often do they return to the same wintering grounds? So not a lot's known, a lot of, lot of thought into that there isn't a whole lot of site fidelity. Um, yeah. Over the next couple of years, we're gonna find that out. Um, you know, the, the migration GPS, that's one of the main points is trying to actually find out if these birds are gonna to return to the same spot um, sure. this following year. So we also really, it took us a while, but we were trying to target birds that weren't just hatcher birds, um, because like I said, there's a lot, lot of mortality curve with the first year um, you know, you 
90% of the birds don't make it out of their first year. So if you're, you know, a second year or your third year bird, you know, you have a greater chance of making the route, you know, more than once. So we try to target adult birds to actually see. So, you know, check back in next year. I'm going to be able to tell you uh, if all those birds have turned or not. Must be exciting to be doing the kind of research that breaks so much new, almost totally new ground, you know. Yeah, you know, I think one of the main things that we're really trying to do is get this whole picture together for all these owls because a lot of conservation management plans arise over trying to create habitat for owls or trying to protect habitat for owls. And we're trying to really figure out, you know, what is it that we need to save? What is What are the characteristics? Why are we saving this? What are we doing? Um, you know, it's not known and we, we don't know. And there's, there's, you know, four species that are, you know, using these like kind of grassland habitats that have these edges and stuff. And, uh, you know, I think we, all of them need different things and we're not really sure what all of them are yet. So we're trying to, you know, kind of create that whole winter raptor picture. Um, so hopefully, uh, 10 years from now I'll have all the answers, but for now I just got <laughs> small ones. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. I'm just amazed by the sheer number of long ears that you get in these kind of sites. It just, yeah, you know, it makes you want to look for them everywhere. Yeah, you know, it. it um, so the other thing that we're trying to pilot next year is like um, we want to see because, like, you know, everyone kind of has their, I think, their typical photo, you know, picture in their mind. Like, all right, this is going to be good owl habitat for myself. And I think that you know, a lot of you know, birders and research and stuff kind of have done a disservice to themselves because. They just like go to the typical spot and you don't know. So we're trying to do some blind studies with um, some birders like, you know, all right, go find some roosts and see what it happens. And then, you know, actually take our hard data and kind of show the comparison and contrasts of like what these owls are actually looking for. Um, Cause I think we've like created such a picture for ourselves of, you know, these, you know, perfect, you know, conifer roosts for these owls. And um, some of them are not using them conifers. Um, we, uh, we, we had a site in, um, it was actually supposed to be a uh, reservoir site and it got turned over to the state and it's just turned into fallow land and it just has um, rows and rows and rows of conifers in it. You know, we, we were, you know, expecting, oh man, this is going to be a great site. Nothing focused. No owls, no nothing. Um, devoid <laughs> of uh, long ears. Um, you know, it had some saw wets, but um, the long ears, they didn't, they didn't seem to like it. Um, and, uh, you know, right across the street was like, you know, not not the best looking habitat but sure enough we caught three owls and you know a one hour span so um you know we're trying to you know put different lenses on uh, what these owls are doing is there any new sites you just mentioned that you just caught three owls in a habitat that didn't seem like the best place for them is, it, is that kind of how you find your new populations do you do auditory surveys do you just put nests in, nets out and see what you get? We do a little bit of auditory. We do a little bit, you know, we, you know, every, you know, just like you guys, I'm sure you have, you know, your birding groups and stuff and they, you know, oh, I think I saw a long ear or I think I saw an owl or I think I saw pellets or something. And we start to kind of get better at, you know, surveying habitats and be like, you know what, this kind of looks good, you know, um, but it, it's totally subjective, um, you know, times that I've thought it was going to be great it turns into nothing and times that I thought was going to be like oh you know yeah you know we'll put these out and take our chance um the most time the most owls we got uh we had put nets up and we just kind of thought like yeah it's an okay spot and then we returned and there was five owls and two nets so um you know it, it's a bit of a gamble um and you know we're learning every time that um we can't quite figure it out because we uh we also had that whole, we had a, you know, you guys have snow a little more regular than us. Um, and uh, we had a large time period of snow and it was at the same time that we needed to catch owls again to put these uh, migration units on them. And we spent three weeks trying to get five owls and man, it was hard work. Um, we really uh, did not do well. Um, you know, we finally had to change up our whole catching methodology and, uh, finally got aroused, but uh, it required a lot of uh, ingenuity. Um, and I think it was just because the owls weren't moving in the snow. They did not want to, uh, they did not want to budge, so. Mm -hmm. 
There are two questions in the chat, so I'm just going to oh, yeah. read those for you quickly. So one of the questions is, how long do these owls tend to live? Uh, so the sawwets, it's, you know, like three to seven, um, you know, more on the three to range, three to four. Um, long eards, it's uh, three to five. Um, long eards uh, seem to have a tougher go of it than the sawwets. Mm. Predator wise, or just yeah, predator wise, yeah. they're kind of in a weird spot. Um, you know, they look like they're a big owl, but they're not mm -hmm. really that much. You know, they the the big limit on them is about three hundred grams. Um, you know, the sawwets they're they're small, but you know they're they're about a hundred. You know, so um, three sawwets to long eared, um, <laughs> and the long eared just don't seem to be as good at everything. Um, sawwets, you know, they're they're these little fierce little predators. They seem to really, uh, they've got it figured out in a lot of ways. The long eards, I think it could also just be that long eards were never as common as we once thought. And um, could be a lot of different things going on with the long eards, but they don't seem to have as good a track record. What are the main predators? Other owls? Other owls, yeah. 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 There's also a question from Gino. He says, um, I put up a solid owl box two months ago. It's 16 feet high in a strong tree and it faces east has a clear path in front of it and it is in our backyard. No luck so far. Any suggestions to attract a solid owl to our yard? <laughs> that sounds like a great um, height and everything to me, um, especially with our roosting data. That sounds like a perfect spot. Um, I think it's just time, you know. Unfortunately, uh, if you don't have a, if you haven't had an owl in the area in a while, it might not take as quickly. Um, I think with the sawwets, they just, they aren't as willing to take to the boxes as screeches, for instance. Um, you know what happens, obviously, but I don't think that um, it's completely known why they take a little bit longer, but they do seem to be, you know, I think it could also be that the uh, sawwets, they have more options in terms of uh, cavities. Um, you know, screeches kind of require a little bit more, you know, they kind of like the old knots that are, you know, hollowed out or something. The, you know, sawwits are going right for woodpecker nests and, you know, they can, they probably, you know, they just red bellied is, you know, a good enough size, um, probably even a hairy, to be honest. Um, so I think it's just probably they have more options, to be honest. Um, but I would just, I would just try to keep it clean and just keep looking at it. Um, I, I think, you know, it sounds, everything else sounds good to me. So if I was a sawwit, I would go to it. Thank you. Sawwats are known for being, I know, um, for holding still as a defense mechanism, I guess. And, they really, um, they will, yeah. Are they yeah, they, when the when, when you take them out of the nets and so on? Uh, it kind of depends. Um, some of them can be a little uh, feisty, um, but they're the, they're the owl that you, you don't need to wear a glove um, to handle oh. them. Um, you know, it, it doesn't feel great, but it doesn't feel horrible when they, uh, you know, foot you, um, you know, sure. long as you, you have to be a little more careful. Um, I, I have a tendency to never wear gloves. Um, I just, I just mm. like to have my, my fingers a little bit more ambidextrous, but, um, the, uh, um, so it's, are they're relatively calm. They're, they're always very calm in the hand once they're out of the bag and stuff. Um, they're yeah. kind of like the perfect owl to do, you know, little presentations and talks with because like you could be working doing the thing and they just they just sit there. They don't make a fuss. They won't flap. They won't, you know, make any noises. You know, they'll build clack once in a while, but nothing like, um, you know, long eards. They're pretty feisty. And then the other ones get worse than that. You know, barred owls are pretty horrendous. Mm -hmm. Neat. Do you hear very few vocalizations from the owls themselves, uh, you know, during all these winter studies? Of course, they're away from the nesting grounds, uh, and it probably matters that so many of them are females. Is, is that right? The, they really don't make any type of vocalizations, yeah. Um, they, yeah. they only have this one, they have this little turtle noise that they sometimes make. But that's the only, and it, it's very, very rare. I've heard it twice in the, you know, 1,500 saw wet owls I've had in the hand now um, or been in the room yeah. with. Um, it's a very rare little turtle they make. 
No longer Not the do case nothing. Of nesting grounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <the> yeah. Case. <laughs> that that toot can definitely be deafening. Yeah, and you know, so the the audio lore plays the whole night. So you know, for six hours, I'm listening to that toot. You know, I go to sleep and I'm hearing that toot. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the night, when we turn that audio lore off. I still hear it. I'm haunted for a while. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we we had we have three stations, and we're adding a fourth one this coming uh, season in fall. So um, you know, four nights out of the week, I hear that. Doo, 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 yeah. Doo, 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 <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> yeah, I've been owl banding, and you got that pitch dead on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the clacking, the bill clacking is, uh, or the beak clap is, um, we, <laughs> I've been a number of times with Tom LeBlanc, and usually it seems to be the females that are more, I don't know if you've seen that too, Sean, where the females seem to be a little bit more, um, they usually have a little more feisty, it's vocal, yeah. but they, they snap more with their, with their, yeah, I think they have a little, they have a little more feist to them, I would say. A little um, strong, yeah. The males yeah. are kind of like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, there was. Oh, I did want to show this one thing. Uh... I was going to ask while you're pulling that up, Sean. Twan, did you get a chance to go to the airport and look for the short-eared owls or the snowy? Not recently. Was up at the no. airport. No. We... Yeah, there were a good number of short-eared owls that were hanging. The one that earlier. they were vocalizing and and uh, for several weeks, and then of course the snowy owl was there for a few weeks as well. Um, but just such a weird place, me, because planes are coming in and going out right where those owls were having oh. the best time. You know, it was it was really something to, to watch. I, I kind of became obsessed in a, a nightly <laughs> regular up there. And those short ears really this year. They were there since about mid November, and you know they're they're usually there in the winter, but I, not this reliably ever. I don't think they they seem to have had their best year in a while. Like regionally, um, we had uh, we had a high of fifteen um, at our like where where that whole um, uh, event was kind of going on with the long eared owl. That's where the short ears out short ears are as well. And uh, usually we have one or two there, um, but we had at one point fifteen of them in a single night. Um, so they, they had a really good year this year. So your long ears really are in, in really open country. Then, if they're in the same area where the short ears are, that's, that's right. yeah, yeah, they 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 use that like the edge habitat that the uh, you know mm -hmm. the short ears are in. Um, so real quickly, I just wanted to show you guys this. So we started writing this malt paper this year about um, long eared owls. Um, so a little little preview. Um, so just like the sawwood owls, um, they uh, will have this whole pink UV um, wing in their hatch here. Um, so the one thing to point out, and this actually holds true with almost all owls, um, they have more banding. Um, these the bands here, they have more numerous when they're young. Um, they're thinner. There's more of them. There's, you know, so when you're looking at these secondaries, there's probably between two, eight to 10 bands when they're young. And then as they, as they get older, you can see these bands get much thicker and uh, much less numerous. Um, and we're, we're starting to see some other patterns in these long-eared owls um, that uh, were previously kind of not um, taken into consideration. Um, so some cool stuff. Um, we we just recently submitted this paper, so um, this is just kind of a draft that I threw together to make make it look a little bit nicer for stuff. Um, but some pretty cool stuff. Um, they do things do a little bit differently than the sawwets. Um, so I just wanted to reference this because I had talked about it earlier. Here's a good visual right here. You can really see the the, the very small, tiny bands that um, they have in their hatch here feathers, and these are the adult feathers here. Yeah. Is there something functional about that? Uh, I don't, I don't think it, well, it could, could be functional. It could be, uh, it could be like some type of camouflage thing. Um, mm. it's probably more so, um, the energy needed to, um, the pigment create, takes. you know, the, the darker colorations and the larger bands, yeah. um, most likely probably takes, um, more food and stuff. Um, but something still unknown, um, you know, 
the the whole world of bird feather coloration and molt and everything is still uh we're still learning new things every day so um but just uh this is just a little uh preview of our you know long-eared owl aging paper that's going to be out so. fluorescence is more intense in the underwing coverts isn't it than in the flight uh, in the uh, flight uh, yep yeah for sure um so um the other thing that uh, the only way to sex long-eared owls is actually using the underwing coloration. Um, the, yeah. This chestnut here, this is that's that means it's a uh, female. Um, it's much lighter color in the males. Um, oh. No, they're not here. Um, so females, they have much much more chestnut in the underwing coverts than the males, but not really something you can see very easily. Um, yeah. There's we use these uh, soil chart. Um, like color cards and we actually do a three part measurement where we um, measure the color of the facial discs, the underwing and the foot and uh, we've come up with a little nifty little uh, statistical measurement of getting accuracy of males and females with that. Um, we uh, spend a lot of days in museums uh, looking at uh, long-eared owls so um, I, uh, I look at long-eared owl facial discs and I'm like, eh, you know, I think that looks kind of female. Eh, you know, I think that kind of looks male, but you really have to have it in the hand and, uh, you know, really get the color chart down. But um, sure. just some little fun things about long ears. Wow. Huh. Right, so much more to learn, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just kind of scratching the surface, which, <laughs> which is fun, um, you know. Because, uh, you know, we're uh, adding more. And then, you know, the hope is that, you know, some of this we can, you know, turn into methodology that others can use in other regions, you know, like especially, you know, places like where you guys are, where it's, you know, you have a lot more habitat and a lot of it's not as disturbed and stuff. So we can, you know, start to really kind of like put together some really intense conservation management plans to, you know, really help these birds. So that we're not so, you know, shooting from the hip, you know. Mm -hmm or just going on assumptions that may not necessarily be true. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Well, fantastic. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, but thank you so much, Sean, for yeah, sharing your information with us. This is absolutely fascinating stuff, so. Thank you, fantastic. Um, yeah. Great, well, thank you everybody for tuning in tonight again. And like I said before, unless you missed it earlier on, but uh, for those of you who are more local and wanna just compare notes about birds in our backyards, feel free to stick around for a little bit and we'll just chat for a little bit longer. And um, if you came for the Isle show and Sean's talk, don't feel embarrassed to sign off. Um, but it was great to have everybody here again and hopefully you'll come back next month um, when we'll have some more information on the breeding bird atlas that's happening here in New York State. Yeah, have a great, great night, everybody. And if you wanna stick around, feel free to do so.